Now to introduce our presenter for tonight's lecture, Leah Brooks. Leah Brooks is a Delaware master naturalist with a passion for sharing the joy of nature and native gardening with others. She has a dual BS in environmental science and wildlife ecology and is the public programs coordinator at Mount Cuba Center in Hocassin, Delaware. I can't wait to learn more from Leah tonight. So at this point, I will turn things over to her to get us started. Hi, Leah. Hello, thank you for having me. I'm excited to present How Animals Over Winter. It's a cool topic and one that I've been interested in since I was in college because I'm always about, you know, where do they go? Everything seems so quiet but things are definitely not just all boring and dead in the winter. There's life all around us. A lot of it is just hidden. So I'm going to first go through some definitions so that we can make sense of the different types of animals in terms of what their strategies are or even how their physiology relates to their overwintering. So first off, I want to talk about thermoregulators versus thermoconformers. And these words you may not have heard before, but I'm going to break them down really easily for you. A thermoregulator is an organism that does actively regulate its internal temperature. Its internal temperature may differ significantly from that of the surrounding environment. And these would be animals like birds, mammals, so us, some aquatic vertebrates, some terrestrial invertebrates. Invertebrates are animals that um, do not have a vertebrae. They don't have bones. So think about uh, insects, crustaceans, things like that. Some fish, a few amphibians, many reptiles, some large active fish like tuna and sharks, many insects, and some brooding female pythons. Just to throw in a little bit of, oh, that, that doesn't make it fit into a nice box. But all we have to remember with thermoregulators are these organisms actively regulate their internal temperature. And then we have thermoconformers. They conform. They don't actively regulate their internal temperature. It conforms to that of the surrounding environment. So we have most fish, most terrestrial invertebrates, many aquatic vertebrates, most amphibians, some reptiles. And the reason that I'm using these terms instead of what you may have heard of, of you know, warm-blooded, cold-blooded, is because it's more accurate. Because as we'll see in the next slide, cold-blooded and warm-blooded are usually used to refer to classes of animals that don't fit in exactly in the two groups that we just talked about. So endotherms, they create most of their heat by their own metabolic processes. That's us, informally referred to as warm-blooded. So they all regulate their internal temperature. And you can see that the endotherms, the ones that create their own heat, are highlighted in yellow. Well, if we look back, not all of the thermoregulators, the ones that regulate their temperature, are endotherms. So if they're not creating their own heat, but they are regulating their own temperature, how could they do that if they're not generating their own heat? The answer is that they are using their environment in a way that regulates their body temperature. So think of snakes, right? When it is a hot day, they may be sunning themselves until they get up to a nice temperature. But once they hit that good temperature, they're not just gonna keep warming up. They're going to go in the shade. They are going to use the environment to regulate themselves. And that is in contrast to ectotherms, which are animals that, uh, may or may not regulate their internal temperature. So that might be like most fish where uh, they are what the water temperature is. And so whether an animal regulates its internal temperature is very much going to affect their strategy for overwintering. 
because if you're an animal that can generate your own heat, you can shiver, you can uh, hibernate. That's a lot different from a fish who's just stuck under the water. You know what the water temperature is, you're going to get some ice insulation, but largely you are at the mercy of the environment. So these terms are one that if you want to research on your own, this is very helpful to know these terms because if you just try and search cold-blooded and warm-blooded, um, it won't get you to the specifics of where you want to be. But this is all kind of overarching. We're going to go over a lot of cool adaptations, starting with some of my favorites, the frogs. And they are first up, they are ectothermic thermoconformers. They do not actively regulate their internal temperature and they do derive heat from their environment. They are not going to be like us generating their own heat. They are going to be, again, getting their heat from the environment, which means that when the environment is very cold, they are going to be pretty cold, but they are going to be overwintering in a variety of ways. Toads are going to be burrowing underground. Aquatic frogs are going to be underwater. They're either going to burrow into the mud or they're going to just sit at the bottom of ponds and swamps. And terrestrial frogs, those would be our wood frogs, our tree frogs. They're going to take shelter and allow ice to form within their bodies and they're all gonna slow their metabolism and go into a dormant state. Now, the pictures that I have there, I have uh, American toad, green frog, and wood frogs. We will talk about the toad and wood frogs more closely, beginning with the Eastern American toad. This used to have the scientific name of Bufo Americanus, but it recently changed. Those taxonomists are busy fellas. They're at it again. This is a very common frog that we see in our gardens. This is a frog that, again, uh, frogs and toads, some people use them interchangeable, but all toads are frogs. Not all frogs are toads. So toads are like a subset of frogs. And they are very common in the Piedmont. They're not as common when you go Southern Delaware and the coastal plain. And their overwintering method is pretty neat. So they hibernate underground below the frost line to prevent freezing, and they may use existing burrows like mouse burrows, or they may use their own burrows that they dig with their little toad feet down to one to two feet deep. When I saw that, I was pretty surprised. I'm like, man, they were really going at it. But they need loose soil, which means that you want to avoid unnecessary compaction in your garden which can be brought on by repeated mowing or use of heavy equipment. So they like their soil loose. And I, I always have an abundance of them in my garden and they are just so fun. They won't give you warts if you handle them. They might pee on you, but they won't give you warts. Up next, wood frog. I bet that some of you have heard about their very special mechanism for surviving the winter. These guys are small and they're actually a type of tree frog. They're found in moist deciduous or mixed deciduous woodlands associated with vernal pools or freshwater marshes. And the adults are often found a considerable distance from water. When they are ready to mate in the spring, you'll often see them in large numbers in vernal pools, which are ephemeral pools. They dry up when it's not spring and those pools are fed by the spring um, snow melt. So that means that since those pools are temporary, there's no fish in them and fish eat frog eggs and tadpoles. So it means that they are well protected. So the vernal pools are critical to the survival of many amphibians, but especially wood frogs, spring peepers, things like that. So their overwintering method, hold on to your hats, folks. They hibernate in leaf litter, and when they're there, they produce glycogen, and they maintain their metabolic processes at a slow rate, relying on stored energy. But they can endure temperatures as low as 4 degrees Fahrenheit and freeze up to 70% of their total body water. And 
How do they do that? It's amazing. So they accumulate a compound called uric acid in their tissues. They also convert glycogen, which is sugars, in their liver, and they distribute this throughout their body. Now, the glycogen and the urea prevent ice from forming inside the frog's cells, where its sharp edges of the ice would cause damage. I, I've cut myself on ice before. I always forget how sharp it is. You would not want that forming inside your cells because pop, there you go. But it forms around it and between the cells. And that means that it is not in danger of puncturing anything. And then during the dormancy, the wood frog's heart, lungs, and circulatory system stop. They metabolize stored carbohydrates anaerobically without oxygen. Other vertebrates can metabolize anaerobically too. In fact, we do that as humans. So we metabolize anaerobically during periods of intense exercise or lowered environmental oxygen, like hypoxia. So an example would be when you're doing intense cardio and your lungs aren't getting enough oxygen to give you all the energy you need. So in addition, your body performs some anaerobic respiration to supplement it. And if you confuse aerobic and anaerobic, I think of anaerobic, it has an N in it, an N, you know, no oxygen, whereas aerobic, there's no N, so it does have oxygen. But if you are doing that intense cardio and you're not getting all the O2 you need, your body performs some anaerobic respiration to supplement it. And then lactate builds up in that time, but the lactate is flushed out when you reoxygenate because a buildup of lactate is not good for you. Another morbid example of anaerobic respiration would be if you stopped breathing and were not intaking any oxygen. You wouldn't immediately die. You would do anaerobic respiration for probably four to six minutes before succumbing to severe brain damage or death. But um, that is, those are two examples of how we as humans can do this type of anaerobic respiration. But the frogs, that lactic acid, that lactate buildup does not affect them as it would us. It's just amazing. And I think that one of the things that you should all do after this is go on YouTube and look up a time lapse of a wood frog freezing solid. It's it's available on YouTube. I've seen it and you can just see the ice form and it does look like the frogs are dead, but they're not. And I've seen countless like documentaries where they feature it and I am always shocked each time. So if you find a wood frog, just know that they are put through the ringer in the winter and we should all have a lot of appreciation for those little frogs. They're so cool. And up next, this is another terrestrial frog. So this is the gray tree frog, also known as the, uh, well, the Cope's gray tree frog and the gray tree frog are two species that appear identical and can only be differentiated by vocalization comparison. And I am not a herpetologist. I am not going to be the one to be able to differentiate them. But if you see a frog like this, you just say to yourself, it's one of those two. And their method, they're gonna be hibernating under tree bark. That's a fun one because they're tree frogs. So under tree bark makes sense. And leaf litter. They're going to produce glycerol and maintain their metabolic processes at a slow rate. Now, these guys, they're really neat. I've only seen them a few times. They're definitely not as common to see as the wood frogs, um, especially like during the spawning period, but if you have um, wood wetlands, you probably have some tree frogs. They're very neat. Up next is Northern Spring Peeper. I love peepers. I love that little peep peep that just tells me it is spring. They're teeny and they are just in the woods. They also are taking advantage of vernal pools. And in fact, vernal pools and wetlands in general are a very imperiled ecosystem because 
Wetlands are increasingly being developed upon, built upon, disturbed, polluted. So if you have a wetland in your area or you have um, a wetland on your property, be very aware of what is draining into it, do your research on it. We should all be wetland champions so we can protect little frogs like this. Wetlands are also a wonderful carbon sink. So this is a terrestrial frog and it is actually a tree frog. It overwinters, hibernates in leaf little or in a log. They love their logs. And they are also gonna be relying on stored energy but they cannot survive temperatures below 21 degrees Fahrenheit. So insulation is crucial, whether that's leaf litter or maybe they're in a log with a lot of decaying matter. The leaf litter is a lot more important than people think. We are a bit past this time, but you know, like a month ago, everybody would be setting their, their bags out with all of these leaves in them that they had raked up and basically just throwing them away or giving them to yard waste. And We'll get into a little bit later of the invertebrates that would be in there because we're just talking about the amphibians now, but leaf litter provides so many benefits for your garden. And most people don't want it in their yard in large quantities because it can kill your grass. But if you just rake it into your beds, it's awesome. A wonderful source of organic matter. I love red-backed salamanders. Now, sometimes you'll see them and they won't have a red back. Just like the bottom right, it'll look to be all brown. And that's because they can have different morphs, different appearances. But this one's pretty common. It's the most common salamander you're going to see in your backyard, your typical backyard habitat. They like to hibernate in deep leaf litter under rocks or in rock crevices as much as 15 inches underground in animal burrows. One thing that I read that they like to do is when a tree dies, right? You have all these big gnarled roots in the ground. They're going to decay almost from like the inside out. And so you're going to have a shell of wood and then you're going to have a cavity inside it. And so these guys will totally hang out in there. They'll love that. So if you have a tree that you've cut down and you have the stump, Allow it to decay rather than grinding it, because even in death, native plants can provide life. There are so many interactions that we aren't privy to, and so I always try to let those natural processes happen. Or if you don't have any dead trees, stick some logs in your landscape. If I f have a nice log, I'm like, oh, that's decaying. It's lovely. Sometimes I'll put it front and center just so I can watch the transformation, watch what happens to it. So rock piles. Let's say that you don't have any naturally occurring kind of rocky areas or boulders or anything like that. You could totally make a rock pile. So cold-blooded animals like rock piles because the stones hold heat and cold longer than the area around it. So rock piles stay cooler during the heat of the day, which if you are a snake, like I said, who's done sunning themselves, because again, you're getting your heat from the environment, you're not generating it yourself, and you're busy regulating your own heat. So you would want to duck in that rock pile and cool off. They also tend to stay moist, which a lot of amphibians prefer. So it's a hiding spot for salamanders, toads, snakes, and many invertebrates. So those are the amphibians. Now we're getting into the reptiles. Eastern garter snake, this is going to be one of the most common snakes you're going to see in your backyard. And if it's in the winter time, you might even find them in your basements. But I promise you, they are not out to get you. They're not looking to scare you. They often enter um, areas looking for warmth. So if they're in your basement, make sure you simply guide them back out. And I do that easily enough by just getting on a pair of garden gloves and scoop them up, take them outside, and then really try to find out where they're coming in. Um, I had a family friend who he kept getting garter snakes in his basement and he had to like reseal his, his windows and make sure there were no cracks where they were getting in. Not because he was scared of them, but because the snakes didn't know how to get out and they would die in there. And it was quite tragic because we love our little garter snakes. They like to hibernate, hibernate in natural cavities or burrows such as those made by rodents or crayfish. 
They like to hibernate under rock piles or in stumps. On really early spring days, uh, when it's still warming up, you might find them that they're sluggish, and that's because they can be cold. You might even find them, if you find one during the winter, uncover it somehow. It, you know, like If you do uncover it somehow, then it may be very sluggish and, and what we call cold shocked. So in that case, uh, if I accidentally uncover a snake, I always like put put the leaf litter back on it and say, sorry, buddy. But they're usually fine. Some garter snakes might even hibernate together and in a group. And I find that very interesting. But the both of these photos I took in my own yard, um, the one on the right, if you can see, it's taken with a flash. And that's because I was actually uh, headlamp gardening. I was gardening at night which is one of my favorite pastimes. And I see so much nocturnal wildlife when I'm doing that. Now, Eastern box turtle. I don't have these in my yard, but I have helped a few of them across the street and we have them at the garden where I work. And side note, if you are going to help a box turtle cross the road, you want to just put them in the direction that they were going on the right side of the road where they were looking to go. You don't want to take them to a second location. You don't want to take them to somewhere that you think may be more suitable because box turtles have a very small home range. And if you take them away from that, they will either succeed or die trying, trying to get back. And in the world of cars, it's usually a die trying sort of scenario. So if you want to be a box turtle champion, not only can you provide them with habitat, but you can help them cross the road. Now these will burrow into soft soil and they'll enter into a period of sluggishness, inactivity, and torpor. This winter cool down is called brumation, which kind of sounds like a, a fancy type of restaurant dish, brumation. I always think of like creme brulee, but that's not what it is at all. They live off of stored fat and their metabolism slows, but they can still move around if needed. I've actually seen videos of people who have um, box turtles as pets they actually bury them in their garden to like, you know, make sure that they hibernate and they have to like place a stick over where they bury them so they, they know where to dig their turtle up in the spring. And I just think that's, that's very whimsical. Oh yes, oh, what time is it dear? Oh, it's time to dig the turtle up. Eastern painted turtle. Here we have a very common water turtle. This likes to remain awake and active in ponds under the ice. Now, ice is a great insulator, so if you have a icy pond, just know that that ice is keeping the water warmer than if there was no ice. That's also why I try to uh, not disturb ice a lot if, um, you know, it's on a larger body of water because it is doing its job. This is a really cool turtle to see under the ice. Uh, when the oxygen under the ice runs out, they do switch to anaerobic respiration and calcium stored in their shells is used to neutralize the resulting lactic acid buildup. So it's basically like Tums for turtles, which is when they're using the calcium from their shell. It's just so neat, the, the mechanisms of how they're able to do this. Up next, we're switching from amphibians and reptiles to birds. Now, birds are one of the big charismatic draws of the winter. Everybody's feeding the birds or looking outside to see the little birds huddling together. We see birds like chickadees, blue jays, robins. There are some birds that we don't see a lot of in the winter, but the birds that we do see are called resident or sedentary birds. Those remain at their breeding grounds year round. So those would be chickadees, right? Migratory birds leave their breeding grounds in the fall and they fly southward to areas with warmer weather and more abundant food. In the spring, they fly back north to raise the next generation. Neotropical migrants are birds that breed and raise young in the U.S. and Canada, then fly to Mexico, Central America, South America, or the Caribbean to spend the winter. Many species of waterfowl breed in the northern U.S. and Canada and then fly south to states with milder winters. And then in some species, like in robins, migration is irregular and differs among populations. So taking Delaware as an example, 
American robins and blue jays remain in Delaware year round, but populations in the northern limits of their breeding range fly further south for the winter. And the robins have a great relationship with holly trees. American holly provides them with bountiful berries. So they're going to follow the holly harvest. And as a result, places where there's a high density of hollies and, and berries are going to have more robins. The garden that I work at, Mount Cuba Center in Hokesson, we have a lot of mature holly trees that are constantly, you know, every winter we have a lot of holly fruit. And every winter we have flocks of robins that are gorging themselves. But um, other fruits that robins are eating, maybe viburnums or hawthorns, if you have a hawthorn tree, like I do, I have a winter king hawthorn, which is a native green hawthorn. The robins descend on that and strip it clean. Also ink berry, lots of different berry bushes, very important for wildlife. And birds are just one that usually people pay more attention to because they are brightly colored and they're musical, melodical. Me, I'm, I'm always like, what are the insects doing down there? But I love birds just as much. And they have cool adaptations as well. They like to fluff their feathers. Their down feathers are fluffy, small, and they are down below the bird's other feathers close to the skin. And the fluffy down traps warm air next to the skin, insulating it against the cold outside. They can also multiply that effect by fluffing up their feathers to create more pockets for warm air. As you can see on the bottom right, there's a blue jay with a very fluffy breast. And right next to that picture is a picture of a down feather. And you can see there's a drop of water on that down feather. And that's also showing the uh, water repellent nature. The bird on the top right is a junco. In my area and in your area as well, they are winter visitors. So they are coming from up north. And I, I think it was either last year or the year before that, we had a wave of pine siskins as well, where they were coming up from um, further north. I believe it was a harsh winter and their food sources were more depleted so they had to go further south than they would normally but the pine siskins were a, a fun treat but juncos are very regular they're my mom's favorite she likes catbirds in the summer and then when they go down to uh, the tropics she has the dark-eyed juncos but they are just so cute I definitely encourage you if you haven't really taken notice of the kind of coming and goings of your local birds, it can be really neat and a really fun way to herald the seasons when you uh, are anticipating the arrival of a certain bird species. My mom, for instance, she's always looking forward to the catbirds and their musical cry. She loves it. I do too. So the high metabolism and internal body temperatures is very important for birds. So they are constantly, you know, eating, snacking, their internal body temperature runs pretty high. They also have something called countercurrent exchange. Now I'm going to explain this more because the name actually is very intuitive, but it's such a interesting process that, that we don't have that it needs a little bit of explanation. So countercurrent exchange, it keeps more warmth in the body core as less heat enters the legs and the feet to be leached out by the cold. So we can see in this drawing, if we go step by step, in number one, we have the warm blood from the body's core traveling down the leg in an artery, that's arterial blood. So we're following the arrow downwards. Once it's going down the leg, we have the arterial blood passing heat to the cool blood on the right, signified with the blue color, that's coming back up from the foot. I'm gonna use my, my mouse here. Um, Amy, shake, shake your head yes if you can see my mouse. Awesome, perfect. So the blood is traveling downward here and then it's going to transfer this heat over to the blood that's coming back up. And the arterial blood that is now cold is going to go to the foot where it's going to lose less heat to the environment because this is very common in birds that are wading birds. And so think about the ducks, the geese, the shorebirds. And so the cold blood 
coming back up is going to get that heat. And when it goes back into the body, it'll be warm. Now you may think, how is, they're just next to each other. How is the heat transferring? Well, you're right to think that because it's actually a interlocking, intertwined network of vessels. So you can see here, this is a drawing of a waterfowl. And if you're following this downward, okay, you have the warm blood going down from the leg out towards the foot, but it is intertwined with the cold blood that's coming back up. So you have the warm blood going down, it's cooling down, cooling, cooling, cooling. It's cold when it's in the foot. Cold blood is going back up. Oh, we're gonna circulate to the heart. Before that, we are going to go in this structure called the Reet Mirabel structure. And we're gonna warm back up again until we get back into the body. And that is a very interesting adaptation. Birds are not the only animal that has this. There are some animals, I believe reindeer has it um, in a part of their brains, but it is just so interesting how that evolved and evolved in different animals as well. But that is for, for shore birds and for birds that are in the water, that is one of the most important adaptations that they have to avoid losing heat. But that's not all. There's behavioral adaptations, which include flocking together and sunning themselves. So you may have seen on sunny days, usually in on mornings, you'll see vultures up in the trees. They'll be spreading their wings. You may think, what are they doing up there? Are they like doing a show of dominance? What, what are they doing? They're actually sunning themselves. So they are casting their wings out so that they can get the sun's rays on their back. And then once they warm up adequately, they will fly off. Uh, these photos were actually taken by my friend and I was on the trip where he took the one on the bottom left and those are all shorebirds there. And if you can see, they're actually all standing on one foot. And that's not because they're playing a game of hopscotch, but that is because having one foot tucked into their downy, you know, warm interior, helps them so that they're only having one foot out in the cold and they're tucking their faces back, especially on um, windy days and, and windy habitats. For instance, this was out on a jetty at Barnegat Light State, Lighthouse State Park in New Jersey, and it was pretty raw out there. So they were definitely tucked in, you know, tucked up with their foot. It was pretty fun to see. And there was a lot of them. So birds flocking together, that will also provide heat. Next up, helping birds through the winter. Because we've all heard about, you know, okay, well, we want to give them bird seed and things like that. And that's fine too. But what's even better is if you can provide them with some native seeds that are left on your plants. So if you have room, growing native plants are a wonderful way to support the birds, support the wildlife. Leave your seeds and stems standing. Composite seed heads like coneflowers, genus Echinacea, and um, black-eyed Susan, genus Rebecca, those are great. Those tightly packed seed heads are wonderful for finches like gold finches, even house finches or purple finches. They will definitely go ham on it. And you can also add a roost box to your landscape. I was talking about birds flocking together. Well, some cavity nesting birds, aka birds that nest in holes in usually dead trees or standing trees, sometimes in, in boxes, they huddle together in tree hollows to keep warm in the winter. And with increasing development, natural cavities are in short supply. In fact, that's actually what caused the downward trend in bluebirds. If you haven't heard of the bluebird plight, essentially bluebirds are one of the birds that are cavity nesters and they require cavities to safely raise their brood. Well, cavities, they used to use the ones in dead or dying or standing trees. But when the suburbs were being developed and land was changing the usage of it, those trees were increasingly being taken down either because they were unsightly, they were unwanted, or they were thought of as a hazard. And sometimes, you know, it is 
perfectly valid to take down a tree that's hazardous to human health, to the environment even. But uh, many times people take them down because they just think that they look ugly or that they're not doing anything. But dead trees are actually so important for wildlife. And so the bluebirds, which really needed these dead trees, were out of luck and their populations drastically declined. But then when people put together two and two and they were like, okay, we need to provide them with cavities. So then they put up bluebird boxes, which are essentially a wooden box on a stick. And the birds were like, this is great. And of course, some other animals were like, this is great. So it was, you know, you have to do some management control. But that's a story of how humans were able to solve one of the human caused issues for those birds. And so when we think about dead trees, I want you to look at it and see an opportunity rather than just an eyesore. I'd also like to pitch the idea of a brush pile. Stacked sticks create a safe space for little birds like wrens, titmice, everything. They just love it. It's a birdie jungle gym. That one pictured is actually in my backyard. I weave the sticks together. And right now my brush pile is probably uh, 10 feet long and five feet high. And yours certainly does not need to be that big, but even a small pile of sticks can provide cover for the animals in the winter. Especially if it's covered in snow, that's extra, that's extra insulation for free. Now I did talk about roost boxes. I want to contrast them to nest boxes. So nest boxes, those are too small for a larger group of birds. They don't have perching surfaces and the entrance hole is in the upper front of the box. It also usually opens from the front or the side. Now roost boxes, those can accommodate larger roosting groups. They have multiple perches. The entrance hole is lower in the front of the box so that rising warmth doesn't escape and it usually opens from the top. So if you are interested in supporting roosting birds, you can construct a roost box. It's very easy. There are plans online. You could also purchase them. And in a pinch, nest boxes will work too, but just not as good, not as efficiently. And brush piles, brush piles are so important. And so I'm going to give you the rundown on how to make them. You want to crisscross larger logs to form a base. Then you're going to cover it with smaller logs and finally brush. You want to leave adequate space for wildlife to enter and exit. You can incorporate natural features. You want to avoid materials that contain toxic substances. So be sure that you know where you're getting your wood from for the brush piles. And new brush does continually need to be added. I... <laughs> I comedically say that I'm feeding my brush pile when I give it brush. I'm like, oh yeah, I just fed my brush pile because it is, it's like it eats it, it, it decays. And so you need to give it more. Rot and decay are natural parts of the ecosystem process and you'll get lots of cool insects, which will provide additional food sources for birds and other animals. For placement, you want to be aware that you're not placing it on existing high quality food sources or cover spaces. So Say you had a pot, a patch of, um, say you had a patch of jewelweed, right? Uh, you wouldn't, which is a native plant that supports hummingbirds and, and you wouldn't want to put it right on that because then what are the hummingbirds going to do? So you want to pick an area, maybe you've just pulled a bunch of invasive plants. Uh, maybe it's an area that you just cleared, something like that. Um, it's a great way to add a structural element to your landscape and it can be done very beautifully. There's, in fact, um, an old English practice of weaving hedgerows, and I've taken a little bit of inspiration from that when I constructed my own brush pile, but there's definitely ways to be artistic with it. Up next, I want to talk about some mammals, and we're going to talk about magnificent mammalian modifications. So the adaptations for cold, they fall into one of two categories. There is resistance, which expends energy, and that's resisting a drop in body temperatures by increasing their ability to create heat. For example, you go outside on a snowy day in a t-shirt. Ill-advised, but I swear that my dad still will. You get very cold and begin to shiver. That is muscular activity that is going to raise your body temperature because you're trying to create heat. 
So that's involuntary muscle contractions. Another way is by a burning brown adipose or fat tissue that's called non-shivering thermogenesis. So if you're not resisting it by expending energy to create heat, then you're going to be avoiding it. This is more my speed. This is, uh, you go outside on a snowy day in a down jacket. You do not get cold. You avoided a drop in body temperature. That's me, that's that's me always bringing a coat everywhere because I run cold. Um, that's me going, oh, it's cold outside. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay inside. So avoidance, resistance and avoidance are two of the ways that mammals are going to adapt to the cold. Now, avoidance is actually more complex than just avoiding it completely. You are avoiding a drop in body temperature, but how are you doing that? You can have insulation, you can have fur or fat. Think about blubber, think about the thick winter coats that animals get. Body size and metabolism. This is something called Bergman's rule. And it's that mammals in Northern populations tend to be larger than Southern populations. And that's because the basal metabolic rate increases with body size. So you may have um, rabbits in Northern populations being larger than their Southern population counterparts. Appendages, appendages that are shorter in colder climates utilize are um, going to lose less heat. So the population of Southern rabbits might have uh, longer legs than the shorter legs of their Northern counterparts. And uh, appendages that also utilize countercurrent heat exchange with that structure we talked about, the network of veins. There's also modification of microclimate regimes, nest construction, huddling, changing foraging zones. Reduction in body mass. This is called Donnell's phenomenon. And that's that some small mammals that live through harsh winters exhibit seasonal shrinkage of the brain and other organs because fewer calories are, re are required. Shrews are ones that do that. Um, shrews are very secretive, but I have had the delight of seeing one under a piece of cardboard. And let me tell you, its nose was very cute. I could not see its eyes, but its nose was very cute. Coloration, gloggers rule. Mammals and bird populations in warm slash humid areas tend to be darker than populations in cool or dry areas. Darker surfaces radiate more heat than lighter surfaces. And dormancy, various levels of dormancy exist. We will talk about them more, but first I wanna go over some examples of avoidance that you might have seen. So insulation. Thick winter coats, raccoons, eastern cottontail, striped skunk, red fox, white-tailed deer, uh, eastern chipmunk, groundhogs, the ones with stars also store fat. And modification of microclimate regime, nest construction. We all see those like really messy squirrel nests and trees. Well, they're doing their job. That leafy basketball sized nest is called a dray and they are high in the limbs of trees. They will also nest in tree cavities. And huddling, white-footed deer mice often huddle in tree hollows or in vacant bird boxes. Ask me how I know. That's because I put up a bird box in my yard and you know who moved in? Deer mice, you know who I'm not upset about moving in? Deer mice, you know why? Because they're so cute. And I just clean the box like normal. And when I opened up the box, their, their little snouts were peeking out at me. And I just cleaned it out. And I just know that every year I have them. And some people, they really don't like it when deer mice are in their bird boxes. But to me, they're wild. If it's not like they're house mice, they're just using it in lieu of tree cavities because I literally do not have enough tree cavities for them. So in my mind, they deserve it just as much. So I put up an extra house just for them. So changing foraging zones, meadow voles, who I also have in my yard, and they can have a contentious relationship with gardeners because they do snip plants and sometimes they don't even eat them, which can be very rude. And I have totally made eye contact with a vole that snipped off my Clematis and just drug it under my brush pile while maintaining eye contact with me. And that was the most audacious thing that a vole has ever done. Probably anything that a small male has ever done. But that's neither here nor there because the meadow voles that we're talking about, 
they will change their foraging zones and northern short-tailed shrews will as well. They'll forage under the snow, which provides them with insulation. Then when the snow melts, you get these weird, almost um, fissure-like patterns in your lawn. That's from the voles. That's because they say, I'm not going out in that cold, you know, non-snowing area. I'm going to stay down here where it's nice and insulated and where you don't even know that I'm underfoot. Another example of avoidance, that's the reduction in the level of activity. So they can eat cached or hoarded food instead of foraging. We have larder hoarders, which are like red squirrels. They'll gather large hoards, like the upper right, which they defend and access when food becomes scarce. And then we have scatter hoarders. Those are like gray squirrels or blue jays, which create small hoards in various locations scattered about their territory. So larder hoarders is like um, someone like someone who always has a bunch of granola bars in their backpack, right? But scatter hoarders is like someone who makes sure that they have a granola bar in their desk, a granola bar in their bookcase, a granola bar in their purse, a granola bar under the floorboards. They're never going to be caught in an area where they don't already have a pre-stashed granola bar. Now, eastern chipmunks and red foxes, they have been recorded to exhibit uh, both caching behaviors. In fact, my friend got a shipment of wood chips from Chip Drop, and they found like a, a dead rat in it the next day. And it's because some fox had on their land had decided that this is a perfect place to cache my kill. And so they were like, because they were like, we don't have any food around for the rat. But no, it was a fox caching its prey. And sometimes they'll just come across like fresh kill piles or something like that. But it's very interesting. And northern short-tailed shrews and hairy-tailed moles also catch much of their prey. And they'll do that in their burrows. They'll have uh, prey areas. But it's just so interesting because we often think about it in terms of like, oh, the squirrels getting the nuts for the winter. But carnivores will do it too. And avoidance continued dormancy. So a period of inactivity characterized by reduced metabolic rate and lowering of body temp. There's two types of this that most people know the one known as hibernation. That's what we say is an extended period of torpor. And torpor is the lowering of body temperature, metabolic rate, respiration, and heart rate. Some animals enter a state of torpor daily for a few hours. In fact, hummingbirds enter torpor every night just because they have to kind of uh, slow down their body functions because they're not drinking sugar water when they're asleep. So hibernation, the old definition of hibernation is a profound dormancy in which the animal remains at a body temperature of two to five degrees Celsius for 14 to 19 days during the winter. After a few weeks of hibernation, the animals wake up, they bring their body temperature and metabolism back up. They look around, they check everything out, and then they go back into hibernation for another two to three weeks. Now this cycle of arousal and dormancy continues until the final arousal where they get up and leave the hibernaculum, which is their area that they've designated as the place that they are hibernating. Now, if you take this older definition, then by that definition in our area, only woodchucks, jumping mice, jumping meadow mice, and some certain bats hibernate. Um, some bat species hibernate, uh, some migrate, some do both. Delaware's bats are divided into two main groupings based on lifestyle. Cave bats spend their winters hibernating in caves, hence the name and often form colonies to roost and raise their young in the summer. Colonies can be found in hollow trees or in buildings or other man-made structures, or they may migrate to surrounding states uh, to hibernate. Delaware doesn't have the typical caves and old mines they prefer. However, surprisingly, the cave-like conditions of Fort Delaware, down in Southern Delaware, uh, provide the right temperatures and humidity levels for bats to hibernate. So northern long-eared and little brown bats, big brown bats, and tricolored bats have all been documented hibernating at the fort. Um, the bat in the upper right, that is a tricolored bat. Uh, that's one that's fairly common. Uh, again, the bats are not commonly seen, but if you, if you do see a bat, it's no cause for alarm. Bats can be seen during the day. 
Um, and most commonly they are seen at dusk. But uh, compared to cave bats, tree bats are generally more solitary in nature and they roost under pieces of bark alone or in small groups and they spend their time foraging in the upper canopy levels of the forest. So all these things make tree bats difficult to study and they've been known to migrate long distances during the spring and the fall. Side note, I have learned uh, since working at my job at Mount Cuba Center that bats like to hide, like to um, roost under the bark of shagbark hickory because it is so fissured. So I thought that's that's a cool fact that I always love sharing. So the new definition for of hibernation, it's more inclusive. It's an extended period of torpor and it's a specialized seasonal reduction in metabolism that's concurrent with scarce food and cold temperatures. It's triggered by changes in day length and hormones and this state lasts for over 24 hours and may continue for months at a time. Brumation in reptiles, we talked about that with the painted turtles, that's partly an analogous to hibernation. However, instead of depending on stored fat, brumation relies on reduced metabolic activity. So it's a little bit different, but similar. Now, how would you help mammals through the winter? Add a flying squirrel box to your landscape. There are plans online of how to build boxes for flying squirrels, or you can be like me and just put up a bunch of bird boxes and see what gets in them. I put this box up in my uncle's yard because once you run out of places in your yard to put bird boxes, that's when you call up your family and go, can I put a bird box in your yard? And if you've cultivated this relationship enough, they'll say, do whatever you like. And then you can put up as many satellite bird boxes as you want. And you'll get things like bumblebees. You'll get things like flying squirrels. You'll get mice. You'll get cool things and you can see them all. In this case, I went to clean out the bird box in this, in, um, this was very early spring. I was like, I'm going to get it all ready for the birds. And I'm like, oh, a mouse must have made a nest in here. Well, you know, I'll still clean it out and they'll remake it. But no, out pops this this head with these big old eyes. And that was my first experience with a live southern flying squirrel, Glaucomys volans. And it was so neat because before this, I had only seen them in taxidermy form in my mammalogy class in college. But I knew what it was immediately because those eyes don't lie. And it, it kind of was like, what are you doing? And so I, I left it alone, you know, retreated to a distance and just watched it. And then I ran inside and said, I'm like, Uncle Dave, you have a flying squirrel in your box. And he's like, I didn't even know we had those. So you too could have the opportunity to introduce all of your relatives to the concept of a flying squirrel. Fun for all, fun at parties, great for kids. So flying squirrels, like I said, they will use bird boxes, but they prefer to roost in dead snags. Um, leave those dead snags and stumps standing whenever you can, whenever it's safe. I recognize that sometimes it's not feasible. Uh, brush piles are crucial habitat as well. Voles, mice, rabbits, they're all taking shelter. Provide water, fresh water sources, streams and ponds often freeze over in the winter, becoming inaccessible to wildlife. A simple bird bath with a moving component, bubbler or heater, that will prevent ice from forming. I have the water wiggler that I just got for like 30 bucks on Amazon uh, because water is super essential, obviously. And then lastly, I'm gonna hit the insects, the interesting insect innovations. So as winter approaches, insects migrate to warmer climates. Of course, the monarchs are the poster child for that. So several Lepidoptera species fly to warmer climates, but there always has to be an exception, right? The velvet bean moth flies up from South America in the winter. I don't know why. I'm not sure if we do, if anyone does know why, but it's a weird old little moth and I love his name and I love his story. So I'm making sure that every time I talk about wildlife overwintering that I throw him in. Now, insects will also enter a state of hibernation called diapause. Uh, they'll become sluggish and some of them will fall prey to other animals or die. So sometimes animals don't uh, adapt to make it through the winter. They just don't. And then their life cycle begins, begins anew. Uh, often adults will not survive the winter, but their eggs or larvae or pupa will. 
it's rare to have adult butterflies over winter, but one butterfly that does do that is the morning cloak butterfly. As we can see on the bottom right, that's going to be one of the uh, earlier butterflies that you're seeing flying around in the spring. I've seen them uh, in the early. It's just so cool. You're like, was that a butterfly? Yes, it is. So I've talked about leaf litter, but a great way to incorporate leaf litter into your landscape is to have soft landings. And those are diverse native plantings under native trees. And the goal is to extend them to the drip line of the tree, uh, where basically where the canopy ends. This way, no matter where an insect drops from the canopy, it will land safely. These plantings provide critical shelter and habitat for one or more life cycle stages of moths, butterflies, bumblebees, fireflies, lacewings, and beetles. Soft landings also include leaf litter, duff, and plant debris. A soft landings can also improve the health of the tree as well. Trees often don't like to have the soil compacted by repeating mowing. So having perennials that grow under the tree and that don't require mowing is a good thing to do. Moths that overwinter in leaf litter that could be in your soft landing include hummingbird moths, polyphemus moths, blinded sphinx moths, luna moths, and many more. There's also Cecropia moths, Isabella tiger moths, and the ones that have the star by them, those ones use leaves from trees and mix it with their silk and make their cocoon out of the leaves that they're feeding on. So neat. Now, landscape fabric and weed berries, you may think that that doesn't, you know, impact animals' ability to overwinter, but it actually does because not only does it not keep weeds out, but it prevents animals such as regal and imperial moth larvae from burrowing into the soil and pupating underground. That's where they remain in the winter. So those beautiful moths on the bottom right, you wouldn't be able to have those if you had landscape fabric uh, hindering their ability to burrow down into the soil. Similarly, you want to definitely leave stems standing. Many native insects, including bees, overwinter in the hollow stems of perennials like Echinacea, Eutrochium, Eupatorium, Solidago, Symphiotrichum, etc. This is actually a square-faced wasp that I recorded. It was burrowing into an aster stem. I watched it for like a half hour and it used its mandibles to get that spongy material, that pith, the P-I-T-H, out from the inner stem and it was just a sight to see. So there's constantly bees doing that in stems. And when you are leaving your stem standing, it's a social media myth that you wanna wait to do your garden cleanup until the spring temperatures are consistently warm. I, I hear like 50 degrees, oh, you know, 60. The pollinators will have emerged by then and you can clean everything up. That's actually false. So pollinators are active when their host plants are blooming and different native plants bloom throughout the year. Thus at any given time during the growing season, there are insects building nests and stems. The time to cut the stems back is when they're not actively growing. So you can cut them back anytime from December to March. Cutting them back in December will deprive wildlife of cover and seed heads. So instead, I cut the stems back to a height of six to 18 inches in March. That way the birds have had time to eat the seeds. Although granted, if you have something that you don't want to spread by seed, maybe for instance, um, I have Canada goldenrod. I love Canada goldenrod, but I have enough Canada goldenrod. And so I will clip that back in December. I'll clip it back to like a foot and uh, I'll sprinkle the seeds somewhere else, but I'll make sure that those stems are ready for the bees next year. So creating habitat for stem nesting bees. This is a diagram from the Xerces Society. And you can see in the winter, you're going to leave dead flower stalks intact. And then in the spring, before April, they're going to cut back the dead flower stalks, leaving the stem stubble of varying height. 8 to 12 inches is great. If you do it any less than like 6 and 8 inches, um, you're going to get a resulting sex imbalance the next year in the bees because bees that are laying the eggs, they lay, I believe, the males first and then the females and so if the stem's too short, they're going to only lay males. And then you're going to have more male bees than female bees the next year. So we don't want that. 
So we want to leave some stems long. I understand that not everybody can do that in more formal areas, which is why um, the lower end of the spectrum does exist. And then those cut stems will be covered with a flush of new growth in the spring and the summer. And then those cut stems, you never have to touch them again. You don't have to clear them out. You can just let them fall away naturally. And this cycle is its kind of, it's definitely new information for a lot of people, but I make it very easy by saying, just cut your stems back from eight to 12 inches or eight to 24 inches sometime during the non-growing season. And then just don't touch them. That's what I do. It's easy enough for me. And so with that, I think I'm ending just on time with how animals overwinter. One thing that I wanted to add was poor, uh, poor opossums. I learned that their little toesies get frostbitten quite frequently because instead of like, I, I literally looked up what adaptations do possums have for the winter. And it's like, they don't have adaptations. They just get frostbite on their tails and like feet. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So you'll often see possums that are missing parts of their tail or parts of their toes. And I thought that was just tragic. So if uh, if you have some nice hollows that they could hunker down in, I'm sure they'd appreciate it. But as for adaptations, uh, they're a bit on the sparse side. But with that, I'm happy to open it up for questions. Um, if anyone has any kind of comments, maybe you've seen a really cool animal adaptation before, or, you know, maybe you have one of these animals overwintering in your backyard. And then Amy, if you um, wouldn't mind kind of fielding the questions as they come. Sure, no problem. Would you like me to um, switch to like me being on the big screen or you want me to keep it to my slides? What do you prefer? Yeah, if you want to uh, stop sharing your screen, sure. we can come back together. Great. Right. Um, so first of all, thank you so much. That was amazing, interesting information. And um, those poor little opossums. I know, mm. I was like, they need boots or mittens yeah. or something. Yeah. They need tail warmers. All right. So a couple of these questions did come in as you were talking. So we'll we'll kick it back to the beginning of your presentation when you were talking about frogs. So the first question is, how long does it take for a wood frog to thaw in the spring? We'll start there. Okay. So for a wood frog, frog to thaw, I think it only takes, I mean, it takes less than a day. I'm, I know that. Um, I think... <sighs> I'm not sure the amount of hours, but it's 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 a lot quicker process than you would assume because when I've seen the time lapses of it, like it's it's pretty crazy. So I would say like that would be a follow up question that I'd be interested in as well, but um, I don't know off the top of my head, and I don't want to give you something wrong just to make myself seem like I know everything. Sure. I appreciate that. Um, the second part of the question was, does ambient temperature going up and down endanger them? Hmm. You know, I think that more of the danger, rather than the them unfreezing and freezing, I think more of the danger lies in the fact that as we have warm days in like, March and things like that, that they, they start to breed like, um, the photos that I included in my slideshow, I took them last spring, this past spring, and it was earlier than I had ever seen wood frogs mating. And it was worrying to me because as they shift, uh, that's what's called a phenology shift where phenology is like the timing of biological events. So if they're doing it earlier, it might mean that other things that correspond to them or that are correspond to other things are thrown off as well. So I don't think that, I wouldn't think that it is the ambient temperature being warm for like one day or something like, like that. Um, they, they can refreeze, but what would worry me more would be 
the more paradigm shifts of are the events, are the breeding events, are the spawning events, are they shifting to different times? Because then, you know, does something rely on their spawning event? Is there something that, for instance, feeds on their tadpoles or something like that that's then thrown off? My realm of, and I know this is getting into a little bit, but we have time. So my realm of uh, my background, wildlife ecology, I know a lot about specialist bees. And so those are bees where um, they specialize on certain types of pollen and they'll only collect certain types of pollen for their larval bees, right? So um, it's kind of like the monarch, but in bee form. And so those bees are very in tune with being active at a certain time when their particular flower is in bloom. So it might be that when, um, okay, so the rhododendrons, when the azaleas, the native azaleas are blue, 